and welcome to If Oxford, the Science and Ideas Festival. Today's talk is all about making a sun on Earth, which for me is absolutely fascinating, finding a way to create power using star power. I mean, it just sounds incredible to me. I'm going to hand you over to Nick Muldahl from United Kingdom Atomic Energy Agency, who is going to start this session on making a sun on Earth. Over to you, Nick. Hello everyone, my name is Nick and as Cathy introduced me I work at the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority and we are going to tell you all about how we are trying to make a sun right here on Earth. Now to do that I'll explain a few things with the help of some of my science and engineering friends and tell you all about the ultimate energy source of the universe, fusion energy. Now, to understand fusion though, I want us to first be thinking all about the sun. Now the sun is that giant ball of hot, bright energy out there up in our skies. But how is the sun actually powered? Well, the sun is made up of atoms, just like we all are. Atoms are the building blocks of the universe. And to understand atoms, we actually need to pick an atom apart because an atom is actually made up of some things that are even smaller. They're made up of three parts. First, we have protons and second, neutrons. And together, these protons and neutrons sit right in the center of an atom, which we call the nucleus. And then whizzing around the outside of the nucleus of atoms are things that we call electrons. Now, all atoms, are made up like this with these protons, neutrons and electrons. But not all atoms are in the same state of matter. Now you might have heard of states of matter already. You probably know of three of them. Now the three really common states of matter that we all learn about are called solids, liquids and gases. Now solids are things like this coconut that I have right here. Nice and hard and firm and I can hold it and even move it around a little bit. But when I heat up a solid, for example ice, all of the atoms start to change. Atoms in a solid are packed in really really close and tight with each other, but when they get heated up they start to move around a bit further apart. And when we heat up ice, well, ice melts and then it turns into a liquid. And here is just a glass of water that I have. Now liquids are interesting because the atoms in them are further apart and that means that liquids can flow. Actually, we can even drink some liquids. Ah, water's a really nice, safe liquid that we can drink to keep us healthy. Now, to get to that third state of matter, gas, we actually just need to heat the liquid again. So if I was to heat up water, what do you think it might turn into? Well, when we heat up water, it evaporates and turns into steam, which is a gas. And there's lots of other gases out there too, lots of gases in the air around us. We're all breathing in one gas all the time. I breathe in oxygen and when I breathe out, I breathe out carbon dioxide. Now, there is actually a fourth state of matter too, and that is something beyond a gas. When you superheat a gas, it turns into something called a plasma. And that's what I've got to show you there. Here is a plasma ball. And inside here, all of these little strings of light are plasma radiating, radiating out from the centre. Now, why am, why am I talking about plasma? Well, it's all to do with the state of matter that atoms are in when they're inside the sun. In the very core of the sun, atoms get superheated and turn into the plasma state when they're really, really hot. Actually, it gets so hot inside the sun it gets up to 15 million degrees, almost unimaginable to us here on Earth. 
Now, plasma is really, really special. I'm going to show you one of the cool things that can happen with plasma. So when I do this, what does it remind you of? Well, you might think that it looks like lightning. And that's because lightning is another thing that actually has atoms in the plasma states. And when lightning happens, you have a big buildup of energy in clouds that wants to release. And lightning has to release right down all the way down to Earth in the quickest, shortest path. So that's what's happening. When I'm sticking my hand on here, my arm actually becomes a much shorter route to the ground. Now you might think that's really weird because it's going up. Well, actually the route that plasma and lightning travels is through electrical conductivity. And all of us as humans, we conduct electricity. So when I stick my hand on there, all the electricity from the plasma is going right up on my arm, all the way down my body, right down to the earth that I'm standing on. Now, plasma is really, really special. And it's one of the key conditions we need to make this thing called fusion energy. Inside the sun, those atoms are in plasma and they're really, really hot. They have lots and lots of energy. And that means that those atoms start to move around really, really fast. Now, one of the other things about atoms is that when they're in plasma, they break apart. So I told you that they're made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But when they're in a plasma state, those electrons actually start to whiz away and you're just left with the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Now protons are positive and normally two positive things would want to repel and push each other away, just like two of the same ends of a magnet. But when they're really, really hot and when they have all the right conditions for fusion to happen, those atoms, those nuclei of the atoms, start to whiz around each other with lots and lots of energy and can sometimes be pushed together. And when they come together, that's when we say they fuse. And when atoms fuse, they can release out fusion energy. So stars have atoms in a plasma state pushed really close to each other. They fuse and release out energy as fusion, which then gets converted to heat and light and spreads across the rest of the whole universe, powering everything that we've got out there. So we're going to tell you more about how scientists and engineers in the UK are trying to build machines that can make that star power, that can recreate fusion. And now I'm going to hand you over to one of my friends, an engineer in our race robotics group at UK, John Whitty. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Nick. Yes. Now, so Nick has mentioned already one of the key conditions for creating this fusion energy, the plasma that we need, the same plasma as you get in the centre of the sun. Now, if we're creating a star on Earth, we actually can't do exactly what the sun does. The sun uh, confines its plasma, keeps all those plasmas nice and close together and very hot by being absolutely huge, almost unimaginably big. So in the centre of the sun, all the gravity, gravitational forces are pulling all of this together and squeezing it into a very tight, hot uh, area, which means that you get this, this, these facilities you need for fusion power. Now, we can't do that because we are not as big as the sun. We can't just generate gravity and squeeze things together. So we have to look at alternative ways of confining our plasmas, of making them go into the right place, making sure everything's nice and closely packed together and very, very hot. And we do this through a couple of other techniques. The first thing, in fact, Nick's already alluded to slightly, mentioned that a plasma, you get the positive bits and the negative bits all floating around freely. And this means that just like a magnet, the plasma can be controlled using magnetism. So this isn't a plasma, this is a little bit of a ferrofluid, which hopefully you've heard of and you can see floating around in there. And as you can see, if I put a magnet near it, it actually forms up a bit like that. And you can see all the liquid moving up towards the magnet and aligning itself with the magnetic field. You can see those little bumps and spikes all along the top there. We can do a very similar thing with plasma inside our fusion machines. 
This means that we can actually control the plasma as it's moving around, making sure with some very complex magnet systems that all of our all of our plasma is tightly packed together and moving in the correct kinds of ways to get these fusion conditions. Now, since we can't, since we're not as big as the sun, we also have to make some other compromises with the kind of fusion that we can do. And in fact, when we're making a star on Earth with some of our fusion machines, we're even hotter than some of the temperatures that Nick was mentioning. The center of our fusion machines can get up to 150 million degrees. That's 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. Obviously, this means that we need to take a lot of care in how we actually control this to make sure it doesn't damage the machine itself. Hopefully you are aware of three, the three main ways of conducting heat. The first one, radiation, we can't really do very much about. We just need to make sure that the components within the vessel are cooled. But the other two, convection and conduction, are systems where in conduction, two atoms collide with each other and pass off their heat energy, which is the sort of vibrations of the atoms you can imagine as they move around, pass off and knock into each other and collide with each other and this passes on heat that spreads through things. And convection is when you get these atoms and gases that have been heated up, and it works similarly with plasmas as well, um, moving around and sort of flowing in through the air and colliding with each other. Similarly, this works with anything, any state of matter that can flow, so that's gases, liquids and plasmas. In order to control this within our fusion machines, we actually use another uh, type of condition called a vacuum. With this, we pump out all of the other gases that we really don't want to be inside our vessel, leaving only those fusion fuels, these fusion, fusion gases. Now, I can't, I don't have a little miniature tokamak uh, with me here. However, I can demonstrate exactly how this vacuum works. So here I have a slightly underinflated balloon. And next to me, I have, Chamber. This is what's called a vacuum chamber. And what you should see, and I'm going to explain this to you beforehand because it might be a little noisy when I switch it on, is the balloon, which contains some air, will start to grow and grow as the air, as the rest of the air inside this vessel is sucked out by the vacuum pump. So this isn't me blowing more air into the balloon, this is the gas expanding to fill the space that's available as the rest of the gases around get pumped out. So let's have a look and see what happens. So hopefully you can see the balloon is starting to grow now and it's almost twice as tall as it was before. This process will keep on, keep on going until the balloon completely expands, but we don't really want that because we don't want a big pop. So I'm just going to turn off the vacuum pump. And just to make sure this isn't a fake, as you can see I'm just going to let the air back into the vessel by turning this valve here, and you should be able to hear the hiss of the air returning. Can you hear that? You can see the balloon shrinking back down again as the air around it is let back in. So, magnets and vacuums and plasmas. These three conditions are what we need to create a sun on Earth. But how does this all come together? I'm actually going to pass on over to another one of my friends and colleagues, Shep, who's a technical officer within our materials department, who will hopefully explain how all these components come together to create this star on Earth. Thanks very much, John. So in my right hand here, you can see I'm actually holding a fusion machine. Well, I say I'm holding a fusion machine. I'm actually holding a model of one. Because if I was actually holding a fusion machine in my hand, I'd have to be probably as strong as Atlas or some mythical creature, because they're massive hundreds and hundreds of tons of steel and every kind of material you can think of are put into these. Now, we've been talking about some of the different components, but first I'm gonna come over here to a coconut. Why am I holding a coconut? Well, I did try first off to get a hairy coconut, but apparently Oxfordshire doesn't get hairy coconuts, but I've had to make one. So I've got my hairy coconut here. And just like the hairs in your head, you want to brush those hairs down. 
And you want to get all nice and smooth and everything going in the same direction. So you're brushing the hairs on your coconut. And as you brush those hairs, you want to try and go in all the same direction. And on a shape like the coconut that I have here, it's very hard to get all those hairs going in the same direction and you end up getting lots of tufts. So we have to talk about different shapes and what is the best shape to get all the hairs to go in the same direction. Well, something like a donut. If I, you know, I drop my donut and it gets all hairy. So I'm gonna brush all the hairs on my, on my, my donut here and actually makes it a lot easier to get them all going in the same direction. So this is where our fusion machine, also known as a tokamak, um, comes in. So I'm just gonna quickly switch my camera here and make it a little bit easier for you guys to have a look at what's going on in uh, uh, on our fusion machine. Do, 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 do. Here I have my fully built tokamak or fusion machine, and then I have a donut here. So I'm just gonna go through some of the components that we have here and try and bring together so many things that both my friend John here and Nick have been talking about. So this is what we call the fusion vessel that sits in the middle of our tokamak or fusion machine. And if we were to break open our donut, we'd actually see inside here, this is what we actually call the backing vessel of our fusion machine. And this is where our plasma goes. So all our plasma actually flows around inside of our tokamak and you know, is moved around. And then to move that around, we use magnets. And on a fusion machine, we actually have two types of magnets. We have a, the, we have the toroidal, which are these blue ones you see here in my hand. And you can see on our model, go around this way. And then we also have our colloidal magnets, which are these circular ones, and they go around this way. And they help us confine this plasma that's moving around. As, as we've talked about before, the heat of the plasma in this is 150 million degrees Celsius. Now, we have lots of different materials that work out of this, but if you actually attend my, uh, my show that I'll be doing tomorrow at six o'clock, um, uh, Super Materials for Extreme Conditions, you'll find out more about the different materials that we use to confine these plasmas. So please do come along. I'd really love to see you guys there. But this all helps us keep the plasma inside of our, of our fusion machine. Um, but like a car, this, that keeps it safe and that keeps or the, the magnets help keep the plasma from touching the walls of our vacuum vessel. But just like the engine in a car, we also need to talk about keeping it serviced and keeping it clean and making sure that the vacuum vessel is clean and is kept up to date. How do we do something like that, John? Well, so, one really interesting thing about uh, our fusion machines is there's lots of different ways of doing this kind of thing, of maintaining these components. Some simple fusion machines and some sort of earlier fusion machines were actually all maintained by hand. But our fusion machine that we, we have at UKAEA um, is actually entirely maintained and controlled by robots. Now, sadly, this isn't actually a real robot that we use to maintain our machine. It's a little bit small, it's a little bit plastic but it will do for sort of demonstrating the kind of principles we have with the robots that we use. So all of our tiles and components within our fusion machine need to be robotically maintained, and there's thousands of them. And as you can imagine, this requires you putting into a lot of thought into how this works. A machine isn't quite as simple as a person. You, it's not as intuitive to use. Sim it does move quite similarly. So you can imagine you've got sort of joints like a shoulder or an elbow or a wrist or your fingers opening and closing. Let's twist this robot round so you get a better look at that. So here you can see the fingers opening and closing and you can even imagine you're holding a torch. You can do the same thing with the little robot here. Now this means that all of our systems that were previously, might, previously might have been maintained by people, we can adapt similarly so they can be maintained by robots. Now the robots that we use inside our fusion machine are actually a lot more complex than this uh, and our processes and procedures mean that we have to carefully design every single component that goes in so that they can work with each other. But there are some similarities. One of our big robots called Mascot, which is a acronym I won't be explaining because it's all in Italian and I completely butcher it, um, 
is actually very similar to how a human body works with arms that hang down and fingers that grip, um, though there's some additional niceties like the ability to multiply the amount of force so you can pick up several hundred kilo weights with very little effort if you're one of the operators. This requires a lot of training and lots of practice in order to be able to use. And trying to make systems, going to all this effort of designing these systems, designing these complex components all together to create this miniature star is a huge, huge and complex effort requiring lots and lots of different people and groups from roboticists like myself to material, engine, material engineers like Shep and all sorts of others. So in order to really just explain why we're going to all this bit of effort, I'm going to pass back over to Nick, who hopefully will have a few words to say about that. Uh, Nick, I think you're muted slightly. Cool. Thank you very much, John. And thanks very much, Shep, as well. See, it's really awesome seeing all of these different things come together to build these big engineering machines like what we're trying to make with our fusion devices. Now, I'm just going to finish off by actually showing a few slides that will help us bring all of that together and also tell you why we're wanting to try and build these fusion machines. So just let me share my screen here with you. And hopefully now you can see our title slide of making a sun on Earth. So we're going to show you why fusion and the power of stars is so important to all of us. But before I do that, I want to show you this. This is actually what our fusion machine really looks like. I didn't think that I could not do a fusion talk and without showing you what our actual fusion machine is like. This is called JET or the Joint European Taurus. And it's actually a huge machine run by people from the UK and all over Europe too. You can see inside the vacuum vessel here. So this is where all of our plasma sits and it's built with all of these metal tiles and these complex materials that you heard from Shep. And now you can see a picture to the side which actually shows what it's like when we switched our plasma on when we're producing that fusion energy. See all the light that's coming off at the edges, that's where it's transforming the energy into visible light. And that is the real color of fusion light inside our machines. It's really pretty amazing to watch when we have it running. And that's what the inside looks like inside the vacuum vessel. But here's the outside. So as John was telling you, these machines are really complicated. They're really complex engineering machines. And this shows all of the extra things that we need to run our fusion machines. We have heating systems on there. We have diagnostics to help us measure what's going on inside. And of course, buried within all the bits that you can't really see are actually the magnets themselves, keeping that plasma inside the vacuum vessel and making our fusion conditions really great. Now, the keen eye of you may even be able to spot our little Tokamak model. Can you see right in the center there? It's got a green ring around it now. Right there is the little model that we've been showing you today. And that just shows you just how huge our, our fusion machine, our Tokamak called Jet, really is. You may even be able to see some of the stairs on the scaffolding down at the bottom of our picture. Jet is so large that it will fill a three-story building and we have to have it in its own warehouse and hall. Now, why are we going to all of this trouble? Well, we live on planet Earth and we're at a really crucial point where lots of different things are happening to our planet. And one of the really important things that is happening right now that we really need to tackle is climate change. The world is heating up more and more and faster and faster because of global warming. And if we don't do anything, all of the different environments that we like and enjoy on our planet are going to change beyond recognition. And then there's another problem as well, and it's called the energy crisis. We have lots of ways of producing energy right now, but 
Not all of them are clean and some of them are running out. So we need to find new ways of producing energy that are clean and that are gonna last for a very long time. If we want to keep the high quality of life and have all of the modern technologies that we enjoy here today. So what energies do we have out there at the moment that we could be using or maybe even using more of? Well, there are fossil fuels. Now you probably have heard of these, things like coal, oil and natural gas. If we burn fossil fuels, we can produce energy, but burning fossil fuels is also very bad for the planet. If we burn fossil fuels, we'll release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And carbon dioxide is one of the biggest greenhouse gases that is causing global warming and climate change. So we don't want to be using fossil fuels anymore. We could use other energy sources. These are things on the screen right now that are renewable energy sources. These all rely on natural resources out there in the world. For example, solar panels, are just converting light from our sun into energy. The tidal or hydroelectric powers use the flow of water and the energy from that to create electricity. And then the last one on there are wind turbines. And as you probably know, they get energy just from being turned in the wind. We also have another type of energy source that we could be using more of right now. And that is called nuclear power or nuclear fission specifically. So nuclear fission is similar to fusion because it's still getting energy from the atoms. But with fission, what it does is it takes really big atoms and breaks them up. And every time they break up big atoms, you release fission energy. Now fission is good because it doesn't produce any carbon dioxide and doesn't cause global warming. But it can produce a bit of radioactive waste and cause other damages to the environment. So that's why we want to be finding another way to make energy. Now, even if these weren't causing climate change, I said that there's this thing called the energy crisis. Now in the next few years, we're gonna run out of fossil fuels anyway. And you can see on that graph just how much of our energy comes from fossil fuels today and in the near future. So, we want to be using more renewables and we want to increase a little bit of nuclear fission because neither of those technologies cause climate change. But together, those two are not going to be enough. We need something else. And that is where fusion power really comes into its own. Now, there's lots of advantages that we could use from fusion. For example, it will be able to give us a continuous power supply and it doesn't have to rely on having a windy day or a nice bright sunny day to work. It's not going to produce CO2. So it's not causing any global warming and climate change. It's also only producing a very low amount of that radioactive waste. So this is what makes it better than the current fission energy that we're producing. And it's also really, really safe. You've heard about all the different conditions that we need to make fusion happen. And if one of those conditions isn't there, then it actually just stops and turns itself off in a really nice, safe, controlled way. And there's also lots of fuels out there. So we don't have to worry about it running out. We can actually get one of our fusion fuels from the ocean itself. And we don't need very much. So there'll still be lots of ocean left out there when we're done and when we're making fusion power in the future. Now, to make fusion happen, as you've kind of heard a bit of today, we need lots of different people all coming together to work on this big mission for creating a new sustainable energy source. And this is what we're working towards, making a fusion power station one day so we can get fusion power into all of our homes. To do this, we need to understand more about the science of plasma. So this is where we're studying a lot with JET, our tokamak, our fusion machine. And there are also all of these other areas. So you can see that robotic center called RACE. In that picture is a little picture of our mascot robot, the robot John was talking about. There's also 
materials department that looks at how we're building these fusion machines. We also need to study how we're going to use our fuels and make them really, really efficient. And then we're looking at different designs and different manufacturing technology so that one day we can produce lots of fusion power stations all over the world. And this is where we're going. We're trying to harness the power of the stars so that one day we can create a sustainable future and build lots of these mini suns all over Earth. So we hope that you've really enjoyed today, but don't forget there's lots of other things uh, that we're doing at the F Oxford Science Festival as well. We've also got an art competition that we're running. If you want to find out more about that, do head on over to our Explorer Zone booth. And then tomorrow, as Shep mentioned, we've got an event all about the materials that are used in fusion and how they cope with the extreme conditions inside fusion machines. And with that, I think we're going to be ready for any questions that any of you might have for us. Thank you, Nick, Shep and Jonathan, for such a fascinating talk. I feel I do understand a lot more about what you're doing over with your tokamak now. So um, thank you for that. We do have a few questions. Um, first one, I, I would say, is somewhat fundamental. How was the sun formed? Who would like to, to deal with that one? So I, I will gladly, if, if Nick doesn't want to take this. Are you free? Okay. So I'll make a disclaimer here. The, the way the sun was formed is very, very different to how we're creating our miniature stars. So there's, there's no people going around uh, building giant solar-sized tokamaks trying to create their own sun. Um, the sun is formed out of uh, gravity, pulling together absolutely huge gas clouds called nebula. Um, called nebulae, really, which are these big clouds of hydrogen gas and other sort of fundamental particles. So after the start of the universe, there was these large clouds of this gas all just floating around, um, and small fluctuations in gravity caused some bits to coalesce. And as it coalesced and was brought closer and closer together, the gravity causing this gas to compress actually heated it up hotter and hotter and hotter. And once you get a big cloud of gas that's being compressed together, pulled together by gravity, that gets hot enough from this compression energy, the gas actually, this, this whole process, this plasma sort of ignites and you get a star. So uh, what you've got going on inside the sun is this constant sort of explosion of fusion energy outwards while gravity is all pulling it all in together. And that's kind of how it works. Very different to what we're doing, but similar principles in terms of how the actual energy is generated. Thank you for that, Jonathan. Uh, I'm sure it's a very, very complicated system. So thank you for making it sound so straightforward. Um, we've had another question from George. Um, how much energy would it take to turn a liter of water into plasma? So I can help with that one if you like. So answer is it takes a lot of energy actually to run our fusion machines. Now said that one of our fuels that we can use is got from seawater. And one of the fuels, that fuel, is called deuterium. <coughs> and deuterium is actually a type of hydrogen. And you may have heard of hydrogen gas. There is other forms of hydrogen, and they're called deuterium and tritium. Both of these actually can be fusion fuels. But deuterium is the main one we get from seawater. And to heat up, our water or heat up our deuterium gas and turn it into plasma, we need to have really extreme heating conditions. Now, the energy that we use on jets can actually get up to, um, I believe it's 25 megawatts, is kind of our record. Now, the amount of energy though, that we then get back out of our fusion machine has been a bit less in the past. And that's one of the really key problems is that we actually need to create more power from our fusion than what we're putting in. And that's why 
we actually have to work towards building these power stations. At the moment, we're just an experiment, just like lots of other science and engineering experiments out there. And so to get towards a power station, we need to be heating our machines even hotter than 25 megawatts worth of energy. To heat up a liter of water and turn it into a plasma, well, that I don't know the precise amount, but John or Shep, do you know how much it might take to heat up a liter of plasma and turn it into water? Or turn, turn up, turn a liter of water, <laughs> superheat it all the way past the gas into plasma. Quite an interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> I actually don't know. I'm, I'm trying to take, trying to think of the figures. I don't know, John. You're. I, I, I hope I, you're a little smarter than I am. <laughs> I, I tell you what. Come by. Come by our store later. I think this will require some maths that we probably don't have yeah. time to go through right now. Come by our store later. Ask that question there, uh, and we will get an answer to you. That's a really really interesting question. I, I, I do like that one. <laughs> That is a very interesting question, but yes, everyone, if we haven't got time to answer your question or it's not answered as fully as you would like, do go over to the Making a Sun on Earth booth over in the exhibition hall um, and the guys there will be more than happy to talk to you in more detail. But I've got another question I think uh, I'm going to pose to Shep. Um, how are the magnets that control the plasma actually calibrated? How are they changed to account for disturbances in the plasma? And does the Lorentz force play into this? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go back to the two magnets we were talking about earlier here. So we've got our toroidal and poloidal magnets. So these actually help the flow of the magnetic fields around our, <coughs> our donut, our um, vacuum vessel. So some of these magnets um, will help the, mag the magnetic flow go around in one direction, and it'll also keep it in the other direction. So we have one going basically crushing it in this way, the magnets pushing the, the fields together like this, and the other one forces it around at speed. To answer the, the Lorentz force question, um, if we were to talk about one of the ways originally that they tried to do uh, fusion was actually basically a very long tunnel that you fire uh, electrons from one side to the other, it actually found out that we're, it's easier if you kind of make it into a into a wheel shape. So I think I don't know if that kind of answers the question, but I hope it kind of gets towards the answer for the question. Um, but yeah, basically we just we're using different types of magnets, and they're all calibrated. We actually have eight of these magnets, uh, eight um, polo, uh, toroidal magnets, and then we have a, a, a four sets, or is it four? Yes, Nick, of the more. More than that, there's a lot. There's a lot of magnets. It's quite a lot of magnets going all the way around. Um, and then uh, over the years, we've developed better magnets that help control things like the tufts I was talking about, like the tufts in your hair, where they will they'll try and not because if that heat gets out and touches the edge of the material on the wall, it'll just straight up melt it. Which you know we'll be talking about tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I would really uh, suggest uh, coming along to our super materials for extreme conditions tomorrow at six o'clock. Um, but yeah, I hope that kind of gets us towards the, close to the answer there. Thank you, Shep. Um, so another question, um, which I think John might want to answer. So Nick already sort of alluded to the fact that you're using seawater to create the energy to power the machine. Am I sort of right in, in that? But sort of how it. are you actually powering the machine? What, where does the machine okay. get, get its own power from? So this is, I like this question. So this is one really interesting thing about JET actually. It's one of the very few uh, bits of kit that are actually connected directly to the UK's supergrid. So this is the highest level of energy power that the UK grid can provide. Um, and in fact, if we were to switch just JET on and run it entirely off the grid, uh, that would cause some fairly major problems because drawing 25 megawatts of energy uh, from the grid um, would cause brownouts and all sorts of other bad things. The sudden loads like that would be very bad. So in fact, to power, to power jet, what we do is we have set two sets of huge flywheels that we slowly spin up over time, these big chunks of concrete and steel that we spin up to get us moving very, very quickly. And then we have them hooked up to generators so that when we want to start a pulse on jet and start our fusion process, we slow those down from their top speed to about 30% 
of the maximum speed. And all of that energy added to some additional energy draw that we take from the grid all comes together to power the machine. This means we actually have to have a bit of a cool down period between pulses, so we can only pulse about every 20 minutes. And uh, because we're connected to the super grid, the national grid can at any point tell us to stop. So at certain times in the day, for example, immediately after your favourite TV sitcom, maybe, we're not actually allowed to pulse because so many people in the UK are going around and turning the kettle on and all sorts that um, the added load of our um, of our machine, which am I right, Nick, saying something like 1% of the national grid's capacity when we switch on, something like that? Well, yes, yes. So we yeah. need we need two percent in total, and half comes from the fly yeah. fly wheels, and half direct from the grid. So yeah, one percent yeah. from the grid. So we're talking so, what was it? 25, 25 megawatts, and the whole entire grid is about eight gigawatts. So just think of those numbers is quite quite significant. And you and you can't just pull that much power directly. It's not quite the same as flicking a switch. Um, if you imagine the if you imagine the national grid is a big swing pendulum, then us turning on a thing is like flicking it or sort of putting a stop on it briefly and sort of jolting it around. So you don't want that too much of that to happen. You want to move things yeah, slowly and add a little bit more power gently so you don't get weirdness. Yeah, you don't want to black out the whole of Oxfordshire, do you? Yes, I don't think that would happen. I don't think we've ever done that, but there's a lot of thinking that goes into how we power the machine. I'm sure there is. Um, so one last question, and I don't know, Nick, whether you're able to demonstrate this or not, but you were showing us the plasma ball earlier and you put your hand on it and it created what looked like lightning. What would happen if you put both hands on it in different places? Can you do that? Is it safe? Really, really good question. Um, shall we find out? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Let's. <laughs> so. Here's the plasma ball again. Show you again what happens when you've just got one hand on. If I have it right at the top, it's really, really strong. Around the edge, you can see it kind of sparking a little bit differently. Now, your question is asking, can we put two hands on? Well, have a try, see what happens. I'll put one hand on first, and then if I try and put my other hand maybe down here. Ooh, can you see? It kind of shapes tries to change the two, but only ever sort of tries to spark towards one, mostly. And that's because of what you're saying when it wants to try and have the shortest or quickest path. So when I've got my two hands on, it's actually splitting the path. And that's why most of it will try to still stay at one point. So when I have one hand off, it goes to one, the other hand, it's really clear when it's one-handed. When it's two though, the electricity or the plasma is trying to be shared between the two parts, but only one will be shorter. So actually, there's not much that happens when you've got two points on, other than it tries to always go for the fastest path. And the final thing I'll say that's actually really useful about that, again, if we think about lightning, if we were stood in a completely empty field and there was a lightning strike, it would be really, really bad because that lightning would come all the way through the air, you know, all the gas in the air, and then hit you because we saw already seen that we conduct electricity and the lightning would rather come to us than it would through the air. But if, for example, there was something else in that field that made the path of electrical conductivity even shorter, then it would actually go towards that thing instead. So that's why, firstly, you should never be in a field in a lightning strike. But if you ever <laughs> are, try and be where there's other objects that would conduct electricity better. So to be clear, if you're in a field in a lightning strike, don't go and hide under trees, because bad yes. things happen when lightning hit trees. Um, <laughs> stay low and to the ground, so other things that are around you are bigger and will be hit first. Thank you for those cautionary words. So hopefully none of us will get caught in an empty field in a, a lightning strike. Thank you so much, uh, John, Shep and Nick um, for this talk. It's been absolutely amazing. I hope our audience have enjoyed it.